Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. Nice to see you tonight. Uh, just like every night, I'm going to try to get to as many questions as I possibly can, but I know that Dr. McDougal wants to get started with a few slides and some studies to talk about. Hi, Dad. Dr. McDougal, how are you? I'm just fine. Thank you, Heather. And um, remember that the advice you hear on this show, you're not to be taken as medical advice. You're to run it back your medical, by your medical doctor. I've got some, some pretty challenging things to share with you as we start off this presentation. So what I, I'd like to do, Heather, is I'd like to start by uh, just showing a few slides, and then, then we can get into some questions. All right, you can tell me we're good to go. All set. All right, good. Well, you may not have been aware of this, but I've been telling everybody for, let's see, 1985, for a long time. For like almost 40 years, since, since 1985. This is a Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is also Breast Cancer Business Awareness Month. It's been... Uh, the month when we're supposed to pay attention to this disease and, and march and wear t-shirts and put out yellow ribbons and, and, and buy drugs from companies like AstraZeneca, which established, it was the drug company that established uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The Astra, Astra, AstraZeneca did to sell their uh, new drug, Tamoxifen. But, but this is a month, as the New York Times told us this week, that it's a month when women who worry about breast cancer either have it or worry about getting it, they get uh, overwhelmed. It's a reminder that they're alive from a very deadly disease and it's a very tough month for them. And that's what this article was about in, in the New York Times this week is just how hard it is for quote, breast cancer survivors when they're reminded to think about your disease and treatment that might come back and oh boy. Uh, also, this uh, this past month, something pretty monumental, at least for those of you who are in a generation below mine, and that is Susan Summers died of breast cancer. And uh, she was involved in Three's a Company, which is a big hit TV series and sold Fly Masters for many years. And she's been an author and an author particularly oriented towards health and wellness books, singer, actress, et cetera. But uh, she died uh, October 15th, 2023, after 23 years of breast cancer. That's a long time. You know, I have cases of women who have died of their original breast cancer 35 years from the time they were diagnosed. So 23 years is, is, is a pretty long time for her. She had stage two, which involves the lymph nodes. And uh, let's, let's talk about some of the things that she did in if you know she would have consulted me I, along the way, I would have told her, this is how I feel about it. But of course, she has her own doctors and her own opinions. And the decisions ultimately, ultimately are, are with the patient. You're the, one, you're the one who will benefit or be harmed most by decisions made. So you know, not that I'd want to interfere with her care, but I certainly would like to have shared a few things with her. Uh, I was pleased to hear that she had a lumpectomy. That's where you just take the lump out it's non-deforming. You want to try and get the, the, the margins to be free of tumor. Okay, so you at least know that it hasn't spread beyond, beyond the site where you've taken the tumor out. Now, when you are indiscriminate about asking the question, have you taken the, uh, the tumor, all the tumor out? Are the margins clear? About 40% of the time, the tumor will come back in the breast. But if you're really careful, you know, you really are the kind of surgeon who takes out the lump plus is careful about getting clear margins and the recurrence rate is closer to about 10%, which is about what it is with radiation or a mastectomy. Now, compared to a lumpectomy, non-deforming, you know, could be basically an office procedure. You've got this, which is a mastectomy. Uh, over the years, over the last hundred years, the extent to which a, a woman has been mutilated has been lessened. At the turn of the century, between the 1800s and 1900s, if you had breast cancer, they took the breast, the muscles, 
um, the lymph nodes and the arm on the affected side. And then we had the Halsteadian procedure, which is what I was trained with. It started in about the 30s and continued until certainly the 70s and 80s. And this is a Halsteadian total mastectomy where you take the breast, you take the underlying muscle and you take the lymph nodes. And then we had a, rad a modified radical mastectomy where we just took the breast and we left the underlying muscles. I mean, this is a quite deforming procedure. Well, if it saved lives, maybe it's worth doing. However, we knew back in 1970 that it didn't save lives to do that much amputation of a woman's breast. This is Bernard Fisher. Anybody in the cancer business knows Bernard Fisher. And Bernard Fisher did a study, a randomized control trial, where he compared mastectomy, you see that on the left, total mastectomy with, with lumpectomy and lumpectomy plus radiation. No difference in survival. And if you understand the underlying mechanism, you'll know why there's no difference in survival. Yet for the last 50 years, you know, I've watched women unnecessarily be mutilated by having these extensive surgeries, mastectomies. And, and I've fought against this during my career. They're becoming more popular, to say the least. Well, you say, oh, this is old data. This is Bernard Fisher. You, you don't want to learn about him. Well, he published his 25-year data in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. That's getting more recent, isn't it? Okay, how about just like a couple of months ago? This is in the New England Journal of Medicine, February 2023. This, again, is a definitive randomized controlled trial where they added radiation to a lumpectomy, and there's no improvement in survival. Look at the figures. 10-year study, no improvement in survival. You, you, all, you end up radiating a woman's chest wall, expanse time, discomfort, ended up with a leathery breast, ended up doubling the risk of dying of heart disease if it's on the left side that you're radiated. And this has been going on unnecessarily. I would have told Susan Summers that. Yes, I would have. All right. And if you review the information on adding radiation, the collective information show that it doesn't improve survival. Yet I can almost guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, if you discover a lump in one of your female friends, family, you're going to go to the doctor and they're going to recommend a lumpectomy plus radiation. Confront them with this data. They shouldn't be doing it. It's an unnecessary. All right. So she refused chemotherapy. I think that was a pretty good idea. But let's look at the summary of chemotherapy results. You find that chemotherapy, cancer drugs that are traditional like CMF, maybe the addition of adriamycin, when you add that, what you do is in premenopausal women, you found, find a slight improvement in survival. That's because they still have ovary function left and the chemotherapy kills the ovaries. It's chemical castration. Whereas you see postmenopausal women, you don't see the benefit from chemo because their ovaries are already gone. Chemical castration is what it is. Now, there are some new chemotherapy agents that I'm not going to chemo comment on. Monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, the new stuff. They, they Interesting, their ads brag about how this is the first chemotherapy regime that prolongs life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what have doctors been doing for 50 years and telling their patients, even when the data says it doesn't work? All right, if you don't, if you don't take care of the breast wall, then you have this happen. And this is an ugly mess to take care of. They don't, a person wouldn't live any less long if they let the tumor grow like this. In fact, they may even live longer. But but it's it's just a very difficult thing to take care of. So you want to get clear margins. If you don't get clear margin to come back to you, and at that time you want to take a little more surgery or a little radiation at that time. Okay. So I only recommend a lumpectomy plus clear margins, no routine radiation, no axillary, no dissection. Anyway, let's get on to one of her next uh, well-known subjects, and that's her, her identical biological hormones, which she recommended. And it's called biologic hormone replacement therapy or identical hormones. In other words, it's supposed to replicate the hormones that a woman makes during her reproductive years. And it includes things like estrone, which is made in body fat, estradiol, which is made in the ovaries, uh, maybe some estriol, which is 
a pregnancy hormone and a couple of male hormones, you know, it's just different combinations that these compound pharmacies make up. But remember, the goal is to make it as natural as possible, to, to make it just like the ovaries. And let's see what happens with the ovaries. Uh, first of all, what causes breast cancer? It's a chemical poisoning from, from uh, factories, from the, the, the chemist, you know, the, bio, the chemistry industry, it's manufacturing, pollution. They, they make uh, substances that, that damage the cells and also they make uh, what we call xenoestrogens, which are very powerful synthetic estrogens that stimulate your breasts. Just recent article in May of 2023 on this whole subject about how pollution can be the initiator of breast cancer and the promoter due to its estrogen-like chemicals, estrogen, I've mentioned this a few times. Oh, one of the things I want to mention too, if we can get back to it, is I, I, I want to mention that uh, if you eat the rich Western diet, you're eating foods high on the food chain. Focus your attention in the bottom left-hand corner. You see these environmental chemicals, they're bioconcentrated, biomagnified. So if you're eating the Western diet, you're taking in concentrations, maybe a thousand fold. As, as a vegan related starch-based diet because of this accumulation as you move up the food chain. So you wanna stay away from these chemicals, you can do it with your food, your diet. All right. Okay, so uh, estrogen, how does estrogen play a role? There we go, let's see if we can hold here. Well, in, in the treatment of breast cancer, doctors typically use AstraZeneca. We just talked about it. We set up Breast Cancer Awareness Month with the invention of tamoxifen, which is a drug that blocks the effects of estrogen, which causes women to live longer who have breast cancer. And another drug, which works at another, at, at another site of estrogen activity are your aromatase inhibitors. You live longer if you take these, okay? Blocking estrogens. If you take your ovaries off, you live longer by removing the ovaries, removing estrogen. If you take cancer chemotherapy, the traditional type I talked to, it kills your ovaries. You remove estrogen. We talked about BRCA on this show, BRCA1 and 2. You only get an improvement in survival. This is a disease where you get cancer of the breast and ovaries at a much higher rate, more aggressive. You only get survival benefits by taking out the ovaries, not by taking off the breasts. Here's the article right here on Chama. Estrogen, it's estrogen. And she and she's she's telling you to take bioidentical hormones. Okay, let's talk about the implication of diet. Susan, Susan Summers, the best I can tell, was a low carber with her own modifications of food combining and fresh fruit and so on. But uh, she loved to eat uh, uh, butter and eggs and all kinds of stuff. Certainly didn't fit the McDougal diet. Well, what, what happens when you eat the Western diet, and worse would be eating these carbo diet, these low carb diets, is you elevate the estrogen in your body by eating the food. You do it by changing the bacteria in your bowel. Uh, you do it by, uh, by your body fat. Your, the fatter you are, the more estrogen you make. You're taking these environmental pollutants through bioaccumulation, like I talked about. Um, the, the, the fiber, other phytochemicals in a plant-based diet neutralize estrogens. So a woman on the Western diet has about 50% higher estrogen levels than somebody on a vegan diet. Another source I wanna tell you about is cow's milk. And people don't know much about this. It's a very, very important source of estrogen in your family, in your diet. What happens is traditionally they would take a cow, raise her in the field. She gives the family a quart of milk once a day. When she got pregnant, Elsie got a break. Today it's 24 quarts a day. You get pregnant, you stay attached to the milking machine. When you're pregnant, you make large amounts of estrogen. So in that way you deliver estrogen. 
So study done, I was actually involved in this study, well, the Women's Health Initiative study by Rowan Chablowski. He's on my radio show. You can listen to the interview I did with Rowan. It's right here listed on the slide. Anyway, what they did is they put women on a low-fat diet. It really wasn't a low-fat diet. It ended up being about going from about 42% fat to maybe at best 35% fat. Their goal was 20% fat. You'll hear me ask Rowan Chabowski right on this radio interview, why don't you do a real low fat diet? The McDougal diet is 7%. Well, anyways, they still showed survival benefits from a low fat diet. Uh, the American Cancer Society has so firmly come to believe that a plant-based diet is good for people even after they have cancer that they made recommendations in February of 2015 for doctors to recommend a diet, a prudent diet based on plant foods, high in fruits and vegetables and unrefined grains that avoids animal foods. That's the official recommendation to you and to your doctors for cancer patients. <laughs> Come on now, okay. Big research paper, I'm gonna end here. Big research paper where the low carbers are bragging about how sh sugar feeds cancer. It's nonsense. But anyway, the, the, in, in, in JAMA Oncology, just last year, they put up all the aspects of a low carb argument versus the, a healthy diet, a high carb diet. And we won. You know, the data clearly shows you should be eating a plant food based diet. So Susan Summers could have improved her diet for the reasons I say. I, I think it was a mistake, the extra estrogens. I think she'd made some wise decisions when it came to, to her treatment. Uh, but the radiation should have been avoided. She didn't know any better. Her doctor should have known any better. And she could have eaten a better diet. But I think those are pretty, pretty pointed, but not so personal comments about Susan Summers. Happy Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Happy October. All right, Heather, I'm ready. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. It's important to talk about that aspect of breast cancer during the month of October. Okay, I've got lots of questions, people emailing me and also writing in the chat. So let's start out. Uh, Baby A is writing in and she's saying, my C-peptide went from 2.23 to 1.17. Is that good or bad? Well, C-peptide is, when the pancreas makes insulin, it, it breaks off a, a protein called C-peptide. Now, the way you tell the difference between insulin that you inject versus insulin your pancreas made is you measure the C-peptide because you can't tell the difference. You know, insulin is insulin. So uh, to try and determine whether your pancreas, in somebody who's taking insulin, whether your pancreas is still making insulin, you get a C-peptide. Going from three to one, I can only imagine to be worse, unless it's some scale I'm not familiar with. So that means you have further deterioration of your pancreas. So hopefully a good diet will slow or stop that deterioration. You likely have type one and a half diabetes or type one. You certainly don't have type two. You know, type two, you'd have, you would have uh, a lots of type two diabetics can make as much as twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. This insulin doesn't work because you're too fat. Lose the weight, always goes away. Lose the weight, it always goes away. They lock you up in a jail, wire your teeth together, put you on a low carb diet that puts you into ketosis and you can't eat, give you ozempic and make you sick from reptile poisoning, you can't eat, you cure your type two diabetes. Doesn't matter. I mean, it matters because one way is healthy and permanent and tasty. The other ways cost you a ton of money and make you sick in lots of ways, including increase your risk of heart disease and dying. Don't do that. You cure this the disease. Point is that, that you must lose weight to cure your diabetes, right? Yeah, because that's why it develops. You see, type two diabetes develops as a natural adaptation. It's not a disease. It's what the body wants to and is supposed to do. As I explained, you during the summer, you know, you have crops come in, uh, the nuts and seeds and avocado, the trees bloom towards the end of summer. 
you got all this extra food and fat and calories. And you, you store up for the winter, but the body only needs maybe 20, 30 pounds to get through the winter. And if you, and so it develops insulin resistance so you don't keep gaining weight because insulin pushes fat into fat cells. And that's why when you start on insulin injections, you gain 20 pounds in the first year on average. So uh, you develop this adaptation where the insulin doesn't work at the cellular level. It's called insulin resistance. You know, all the pop dieters talk about insulin resistance. It, the body does it because it's supposed to. It's a natural adaptation. If you don't develop insulin resistance, then the insulin keeps pushing fat into your fat cells and your blood sugar is normal. You're likely it's normal. Your blood pressure is normal. Your cholesterol is normal. You're, you're actually in pretty good health, except for carrying around two, three, four, five hundred 500 extra pounds because your body just doesn't shut off this weight gain. That's to your disadvantage to be 200 pounds overweight. You know, you increase risk of falling down, you know, all kinds of reasons you would get hurt or killed by being that morbidly obese. Maybe that's why I call it morbid obesity. Maybe the word morbid ain't so good. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Next question. Is it okay if I don't eat any grains if I'm eating a lot of other starches like potatoes? Yeah, it's fine. You know, people in Papua New Guinea eat 92% of their diet with sweet potato leaves and roots. Uh, the people in Peru and the Andes, uh, their diet is potatoes. They have uh, at least 400 different species of potatoes that they grow. And so they live on, on potatoes. So they switch to quinoa, which is, which is a grain, uh, when they go to battle because potatoes are just too heavy. But yeah, they, the people in the Andes, they live on potatoes. There are a whole bunch of experiments that I've shared with you on people who lived on potatoes alone. Like for example, Mikhail Hinhiti, during uh, just, just prior to World War I, he had a, well, a patient called Madsen and the Madsen lived on potatoes and water, pretty much a little fat, no other vitamins or mineral foods at all. Lived on, on potatoes alone for a year. In 1928, there was an experiment of a man and woman where they locked them up for six months and fed them only potatoes to get all their nitrogen, all their protein. You know, so yeah, potatoes are fine. It might get a bit boring, but that's a good way to lose weight, is to get bored. When, when the food isn't interesting, you eat less of it. If you want to lose weight faster, leave the salt out of the food. You won't like it. But you'll adapt to it, and then you'll like it, and then you'll eat it. So, so I know this next uh, topic you like to say you're not an expert on, but we always want to hear your opinion. So Dan's wanting to know whether you recommend the RSV vaccine. I don't know, Heather. You know, I, I see it advertised a lot on TV, which always makes me suspicious. You know, some drug companies making a ton of money. I, I don't know because I haven't seen the reports on it. It's, it's pretty new. And, and certainly if it is against a stable virus, where I'll have some long-term protection, I'll, Mary and I'll get it. I don't want to get sick. You know, the problem with COVID viruses and with flu viruses is they have a high tendency to, to undergo genetic drift. They mutate. And so they turn into another virus that the vaccine doesn't work for long, long before they they put the program out. And so it's basically useless because the new virus, because of genetic drift comes along and we don't have a vaccine for that one yet. We will in a couple of years, but that will be gone too. and be some other virus. That's the problem with these viruses. So if RSV turns out to be a stable virus, doesn't mutate, undergo this kind of genetic drift, then yeah, I'll get it, absolutely. Unless I learn something else terrible about it, which I don't expect. Thank you. Uh, this next question is from Kim, and she has been recommended to take mineral oil for her constipation. She also has some anal issues, some scarring. Yeah. And so she's wondering, you know, we're no oil and is wondering right. about this. Mineral oil is not absorbed. 
it stays in the gut. So it's not going to contribute to your, any metabolic problems or fat problems or oily skin. It's, it just stays in the intestinal tract and it kind of loosens things up. It's a good way to relieve very impacted people. You know, this, this can be really serious, this kind of impaction that goes on, you know, to the point where you have to have, a, a, you know, colonoscopy done to remove hardened feces. So, so anyway, that one of the way to deal with that would be mineral oil, alkamagnesia, X-lax. I mean, there are many different ways to, to get the balls stimulated. But you, the first place you want to try not to get constipated. That's key means the right food, high fiber food, and to keep well hydrated and active. And then try prune juice. So prune juice, I think, is, is, the, is the first step to improving the balls. It's right there in the refrigerator. Tastes terrible, so you're not going to drink a lot of it. And it uh, you know works in like in six or eight hours. And then you go on to something like Malcolm Magnesia. And maybe try some stronger like X lax or something. And then mineral oil be way up, way up the line on things I would try. But don't worry, it's not going to hurt you. Good to know. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. This question comes up a lot. We're in the middle of a 12 day program right now. And this is a topic that we've been talking a lot about. Uh, this is from Rebecca. Is there something I can be eating or not eating that is contributing to my osteoarthritis in my joints? She wants to avoid a hip replacement. Okay. I've written on osteoarthritis on the website, and I've also written on extensively on inflammatory arthritis. Osteoarthritis is known as wear and tear arthritis. It's also known as degenerative arthritis. You're told it occurs as you get older from normal wear and tear. That's not true. Inflammatory arthritis is like rheumatoid, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis. These are arthritis where the immune system attacks the joints. Completely different problem. Well, except that the two can be combined. You might have a little degenerative and a little inflammatory. In that case, the diet might help you. Uh, the reason I say it's, it's not a normal condition is because when you look around the world or you know the world 50 years ago you found that you find that osteoarthritis is virtually unknown in rural african populations where they care you know they worked all day in the fields you know, hoeing and carrying heavy baskets on their heads and they never got worn, worn out joints whereas in the countries where people eat the western diet something as simple as is writing with a pencil or, or sewing buttons on a shirt it is too much stress for the joints to take. And that's because of poor nourishment of the joints from the Western diet. So they break down. And is it is does it heal? Well, you know, there's some evidence it does. There's one paper I know where they changed the exercise routine and they stopped damaging the joints and they showed some healing. There's also a product called a, a chondritin that they, you know, had some early evidence on that it helped healing. I don't think the later evidence shows that. So uh, you might have a combination of some inflammatory going on. And if that's relieved, then you're going to be helped with the pain. What would I say is a general assessment of my experience only? About half the people who I meet who have pain that I think is due to osteoarthritis show improvement when they change their diet especially if it's in the lower extremities, because they also lose weight, which takes a lot of pressure off those joints. So what I would say is do everything you can, lose the extra weight, be kind to the joints. If they hurt, don't exercise them, don't damage them any further. Keep yourself comfortable. I don't know of any safe pain medicine to, to use, but whatever, whatever your flavor is for pain medicine, keep yourself comfortable. And, and see if uh, if you can tolerate a little longer because they're going to take your hip out and throw it in a trash basket. They're going to take your knee off and throw it in a trash basket. It's gone. Doesn't matter how bad it's damaged. You don't have to get it, get it done early for any particular reason. Just wait till you can't take it anymore. It's, these are great operations. You know, uh, changes people's lives. Artificial hips and now knees and and other joints. So, um, you know, you're looking forward to 
something that I, I'm sure you dread like surgery, but all, at the end, at the end of this, all you're going through, uh, like, I think you're gonna be like most people, you're really, really pleased you had the operation. But getting yourself ready for the operation is important too. You know, as I've told you many times, I, I put myself through medical school as a surgical nurse. So I was in there all the time, the doctors commenting when they slice into it over the hip, you know, as, as the incisions made and the skin flaps open and the fat comes spilling out, you know, the surgeon says, you know, this is going to be a hard one. I got to dig through all this fat to get down to my job. So be kind to yourself and your doctors, you know, lose the, get yourself in shape. You know, get that fat out of there so they can get in and get the job done. Really, slice the skin. Just like a butterball erupting comes out of the wound. Disgusting. Thank you. Some surgeries can be great, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, uh, there are some drugs that are great too, like antibiotics. You know, there are amazing drugs out there. Some of most of the drugs that I really like are ones that I learned, uh, like thyroid supplement and digoxin, and careful use of diuretics and beta blockers, and careful use of insulin. You know, these drugs are the ones that last. These are the ones that you know. Once they drug companies have made all their money and they're all ready to move on to the next one, these drugs are still there because they're the ones that really work, are safest and cheapest. So new drugs will come and go, but the old standbys that really, really work will still be here. Thank you. Next question from Bill. He wrote in and he's wondering if oil will make your blood pressure go up. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense that it'll sludge your blood. There's some videos I show. Uh, they're actually out of a hamster cheek pouch done by my friend Roy, Roy Swank when he was alive. At, Oregon Health and Science University, where he was for 23 years the head of neurology, treated MS with close to, well, let's just say he got extremely, extremely good results and published them. But anyway, he did a video where you show that uh, that the that the, the blood sludges and sticks together, which increases peripheral resistance. Now, these studies were done in, in humans. They were done by Peter Quo, a guy named Williams, there are a couple other doctors that, that did these studies, the Friedman. And, and they're all listed in the slides that I do, which you can find on, on the internet, on my talk on heart disease, on YouTube, on McDougall. So the thing about the studies done by Friedman and Peter Quo and Williams are that they found that animal fat sludges the blood less severely for a less long period of time than does vegetable fat. And then some studies that I talked to you about on cancer, uh, vegetable fat is a stronger promoter of cancer than animal fat. There are certain kinds of vegetable fats like cornell that damage the arteries terrible. Uh, they increase the risk of gallbladder disease. Vegetable fats, Increase the risk of gallbladder disease tremendously. Why? Why? Because you know you've heard vegetable fats lower cholesterol. Well, they do it by increasing the metabolism in the liver, which forces cholesterol out of the body and into the gallbladder. Gallstones are made of cholesterol, so when you add polyunsaturated fats to your program, you supersaturate the bile with cholesterol. All doctors know this is the reason for gallstones. So you have more gallstones. These vegetable fats are dangerous unless they're in the vegetables and then they're healthy. But once you take them away from the olive or the corn or the orange or whatever, then, then they've, they've lost all of their healthy natural properties. Now they're drugs at best. Serious toxins are worst. Isolated concentrated nutrients. Be careful. Thank you. Uh, lots of chatter going on in the chat about soy and breast cancer. Can you comment on that? Well, this is, a, this is an important one, Heather, because, you know, we've learned along the way. You know, the public has gotten a certain amount of education, and you've got to realize, you know, some of it's true, but it gets, it gets couched in an 
in a situation where it doesn't turn out to be good advice. And so it is with soy. Uh, we learned that soy had estrogen stimulating effects and estrogen antagonistic effects. Okay, so agonistic and antagonist does both at the cellular level. Because of this, a, a patient will typically go and ask their doctor, does eating soy have anything to do with breast cancer? And the doctor will take, this is the, as far as I know, it's still the common answer, is uh, if you don't have breast cancer, you should eat soy and take advantage of the antagonist effects of stimulation of the breast. But if you do have breast cancer, you shouldn't be eating soy because it might promote the cancer. The truth of the matter is the physicians don't know. And the data is still incomplete, but the research papers I have say this. In, in the women who get breast cancer, say in Japan, if you look at their soy intake, tofu intake, for example, you find those with more soy intake live longer. And I think that's probably the case, but that shouldn't lead somebody to eating a diet based on soy, which, uh, you know, some people have done for prostate and for Milken, Michael Milken, is that right? This guy with prostate cancer was a great big estrogen soy, big soy consumer, but he's alive still. I may have the name wrong, but anyway, uh, so I, I think soy should be a condiment. That's the way we ask you to eat it, you know, as, as a tiny bit of in, interest in your meal. But you should not be centering your diet around soy for a whole bunch of reasons. It's, soybeans are 40% fat, tofu is 52% fat. Uh, fake foods can be 70% fat, like cheese, fake cheese, soy cheese. So. It's with high fat, high protein, relatively low, low carb, has some estrogen-like properties to it. Condiment. Thank you. Our next question, this is from Fawn. She wrote in and she has a adult son who just had his entire colon removed. So she's worried yeah. about his microbiome and is wondering how she he should be eating. Well, he's going to, you know, his doctor is going to tell him to eat the standard American diet, most likely. And that, that's what most people end up uh, doing. But I, I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I know this. That I wouldn't recommend that as good advice. But what happens is when you have the colon, you, you got six, eight feet of colon removed, is you remove the storage sack for at least 400 different kinds of bacteria. You have uh, parasites and viruses and prions and all kinds of, of, of little microbes living in this sack. There's four trillion microbes per cc. All right, so th there's a little bunch of factory going on, important stuff with the immune system, uh, making vitamins, uh, de deactivating estrogens and cholesterols and all kinds of wonderful things are doing, being done in this bacterial field. And if you remove it, this, this, this organ is so important. It's as important as your kidneys and your liver. The, 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 the last part of the small intestine takes over. So he'll get a new large intestine back. And, and all that function will go up into the last part of the, large, of the small intestine. And yeah, that's what happens because you need that, he'll be okay. And maybe this is a good time to teach him that if he wants to put good good little microbes in his colon, which will now be a small intestine, eat starches, vegetables, and fruits. It's the message I give him. Thank you. Uh, okay, Jean wrote in and she's wondering if you can talk about the studies that showed that pea protein powder reduced calcium absorption in our bones. Well, well I, I, I just don't have them right at the moment, but uh, I do have them. Uh, where you would find them is under the lecture on nutrition on YouTube. Uh, there's a, a, a lecture on protein. 
And in there, I talk about David Jenkins studies, which use vegetable proteins. And uh, I talk about studies done on wheat proteins, soy proteins, et cetera. So it should be easy to find. Uh, these vegetable proteins causing calcium loss. But David Jenkins did the studies at the University of Toronto. But uh, they're out there. You'll find them. But this is isolated pea protein, and this is not peas. This is isolated pea protein, less like isolated soy protein and isolated wheat protein. They've taken all the fat, all the carbohydrate, all the fiber away. It's just a bunch of crystalline protein. That's what we're talking about. And they, even then, you know, the vegetable powders, protein concentrates are not as harmful as animal protein concentrates, but they're still harmful. They cause calcium loss in the urine. This and is. we should probably clarify right now that the soy that you were talking about is just regular tofu, soy milk, edamame, not the isolated soy protein that we want to stay away from. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We don't serve the isolated soy proteins. Right, so soy proteins, they cause more calcium loss than isolated cow milk protein does. Isolated, uh, isolated soy proteins cause a greater rise in IG IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, which is a hormone produced in the cells of the body. A greater, twice the rise in IGF-1, as does isolated cow's milk protein. The problem with IGF-1 is IGF-1 promotes growth. So it accelerates aging. So signs of aging in people who have uh, IGF-1 higher levels will be greater. Uh, it promotes cancer. It's one of the hottest topics in cancer growth is insulin-like growth factor one. So you wanna keep your IGF-1s low. And uh, you know some of these like soy proteins really toxic. Thank you. Uh, Green Grapes is writing in and she is breastfeeding and eating a starch-based diet, but can't seem to lose uh, the last 10 pounds and is wondering if you have any suggestions. Well, maybe maybe, maybe the, the setup between you and the baby is requesting that, that, that you keep a little extra 10 pounds there. I just, it'd be the same advice I'd give you. Never do it by being hungry. Okay, your hunger drive will make sure you and the baby are okay. So once you do um, natural things like you know, go on low low carb diets or or take Ozempic or, or or go on a diet and starve, then then you're putting you and the baby at risk. But otherwise, you don't have to worry about getting enough vitamins and minerals, et cetera, nor nor making sure that baby has enough fat and other things that the milk should be supplying. So uh, tell me the question again, Heather. I got sidetracked. Well, she's just wondering about weight loss, but you're saying maybe oh, she's- oh, you, you have to do the same it. things. You know, you simplify the diet, you try the maximum weight loss, you exercise, the same old stuff, the last 10 pounds. But li likely it just finishing the nursing is gonna make a difference. Uh, you know, you're hungry, see you're, the problem is, is you, you're, you were pregnant. You, you release the pregnancy hormone called progesterone. Progesterone increases appetite. This is nature causing you to gain weight for the baby. I don't know that I can beat that. You're, you're, you're ravenously hungry to feed the baby. And that's why I say when you stop the nursing, your appetite may be more designed to you getting a body that's 10 pounds less. Right now, right now, he wants to make sure there's enough fat stored in case there's a shortage for that baby. Thank you. Okay, next question from Lemon Slice. They're, they eat 95% whole food. They've been on omeprazole for three years and cholesterol meds and are trying to wean off the omeprazole. What's your yeah. feeling about that? Well, omeprazole is called a proton pump inhibitor. I almost never prescribe them. I have to be really desperate before I do. What happens, the way they work, they're like Prilosec and Nexium and you know, purple pill type stuff. They're sold in grocery stores. They're sold, sold in drug stores in the US. What they do is they block the 
the excretion of acid, hydrogen, protons from the body, the bloodstream into the gut where they're supposed to be eliminated. Well, it takes and it pumps acid that the body makes or you eat into the stomach and it lowers the pH of the stomach, acid. And that's what is inhibited by these proton pump inhibitors. The, the problem is, is when you inhibit the excretion of acid is it stays in the body. So you have an acidic body, which sets you up for fractures. So you have a higher rate of fractures. Because you don't have the acid in the stomach, you're more likely to get fatal pneumonia. Maybe a greater risk of having adenocarcinoma of the stomach too. So that, that's just some of the things with proton pump inhibitors. I, I would make it a, a, a huge goal to get off of them. And uh, the, way, the way I do it is, of course, the diet is paramount. You have to realize on our diet, there are certain foods that irritate the stomach. There are raw vegetables in particular. In, in even more specific, onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes. Raw, terrible indigestion in many people, including myself. Fruit juice, like pineapple juice and orange juice, terrible indigestion. But the fruit doesn't bother us. So you can eat the whole fruit. So the basic starch diet with fruits and vegetables cooked. Everything cooked because it's more digestible. This is where you start. And then what you do is you raise the head of your bed. Very important. That keeps acid out of, this, out of the esophagus and uh, helps solve all this. You want to make sure you take stop taking drugs that cause your stomach to be upset too, like aspirin and on anti-inflammatory drugs. Caffeinated beverages, decaf, terrible irritation. So if you're still pushing down the coffee, don't expect to get better. All right, so you've done that. And then the next step is you would take wafer antacids like Tums. And then the next step would be to take H2 blockers called Tagamet, which you buy over the counter also. Uh, well worth your trouble to get off the protein pump inhibitors. But you got you got a lot, a lot of maneuvering to do there. And I have to tell you maybe... Maybe once a year, I'd find somebody who I just couldn't stop stop them, either because they didn't make the changes I suggested or it didn't work. I had to put them back on the proton pump inhibitors, but only one, maybe once a year. And I took, you know, probably hundreds of people off antacids. Thank you. Our next question. This is from Lori. She's wondering if there is a reason to keep someone on a statin or a heart medication. Well, yeah, sure there is. Like, for example, you know, if you had atrial fib and you were not a very healthy person, I'd put you on something that's in the blood, like aliquot or Coumadin. If you were atrial fib and you had too fast a heart rate, I'd put you on a drug that slowed the heart rate, like digoxin and or beta blockers. If you had atherosclerosis severe, then the indication would be that you should take statins. In other words, if you've had a heart attack, bypass surgery, stroke, angioplasty, maybe maybe a high, a high calcium heart scan might encourage you to think you fall in that category. You have to fall in the category that says, I'm at high risk of having something disastrous happened to me soon. I know that because I look back and I see what happened to me just recently or over the past years. And you've already had something happen. We call this secondary prevention. You've already had something happen. Secondarily, we'll try and prevent future things from happening. And in that case, you should be on stands. That's the general recommendation. And that's the way I prescribe them. If you haven't had something bad, you're not at high risk, don't take them. They're pretty useless anyways but they may show some benefit in people who have already had severe disease. There, there are lots of, we've talked about these cholesterol oil products many times. There are the PSCK9s. I think I got that sort of right right now. Anyway, there are drugs that cost about 10,000 bucks a year. They're given by, uh, by injection. Not been shown to reduce the risk of dying, but you pay 10,000 a year. The drugs like uh, berberine, which you buy at Amazon over, over the counter, so to speak, and they lower the cholesterol just as well. They have not been shown to reduce the risk of dying of heart disease either, or neither of any of the other new agents. And statins have barely shown the benefit of 
reducing the risk of dying of heart disease and only in really sick people. They put billions of dollars behind that, that drug. Mm -hmm. Eat the food. Eat the food. Our average drop in cholesterol, I've told you, in seven days is 22 points. And it's maintained as a group in a year at 20 point, point reduction. It's maintained. People do this. They like the results. They like the food. Okay, next question. This is from Victoria. She wants to know if there's any benefit in adding Benefiber to your diet for extra fiber. Uh, well, maybe. Be careful, though. You might get some extra ball cramps. And, and they say doing things like that, adding extra fiber, you you complex minerals, and you might become mineral deficient. Um, probably not. Not high risk. But uh, you'd have a bigger ball movement if you added fiber. You would lower your blood sugar a little bit because the fiber keeps the carbohydrates in the ball and makes them absorb more slowly. And uh, let's see what else. You'd lower your cholesterol more. But remember, it, the, the fiber absorbs things. So it absorbs nutrients like, like minerals and, and maybe, maybe vitamins. So I would try and get a boy without any extra fiber if you could, but if you need it for some symptomatic relief, if you're taking it just because you think it's generally healthy, don't do it. You're, you're eating the correct amount of fiber in the food based upon nature's design. That's enough. You're eating about 120 grams a day of fiber, maybe at least 60 grams. The average American eats eight to 10 grams of fiber. You get plenty of fiber. Anyway, if you need for some particular sign or symptom, like you're a bigger bomb movement you want to have, then you might consider it. But look for the results. See if it's what you're looking for. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Sandy. And she's wondering if decaf coffee is okay because she's, oh, she's trying to give up regular coffee, but she's getting headaches. Oh, yeah. so she's wondering if switching to decaf is a better option. Well, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help you with the headaches. The headaches are due to caffeine withdrawal. So is depression. We used to have a terrible time when we start ran our program with no caffeinated beverages. Uh, people would spend the first day or two in their rooms because they were depressed and it's just severe headaches. And so uh, I think you have to be careful about caffeine withdrawal. You, you, you do it by cutting down. That may be a good way. But of course, the easiest thing to do is just stop and suffer and get over it. But you could switch to tea, which has caffeine which will give you fewer side effects and a much more healthy and lower dose of caffeine. So switch to black teas. And, uh, you know, you can always take no, do no dose pills. <laughs> Those caffeine pills. I suppose, why not? You know, and you can, if you had trouble figuring out what to do with the, with the, with the cup of coffee, you can always take a no dose pill, which has the milligrams of caffeine in it. You can divide it up and slowly withdraw yourself. Now, I just quit the coffee. You'll suffer a bit, but it's so nice to get rid of the indigestion and the nervousness and the sleepless nights. It'll be worth it. Thank you. Next question from Ted. He's writing in saying his PSA is 17 up from eight, four years yeah. ago. Is he crazy for not wanting to get a biopsy? No, that's what I would do. No, I wouldn't get a biopsy. Look, if you go out and randomly check men on, off the street, 10% of them are going to be positive, their PSA are. And then if you send them off to biopsy, then at least, or at least on average, 30% will be shown to have prostate cancer. All right? So then you get into a situation where now you have a, diagnosis of prostate cancer, you're told by your doctors, you can have watchful waiting, which is to do nothing until you develop signs and symptoms. You can have radiation or you can have surgery. Will you ask the doc, which, what do you think I should do? Well, they result in the same outcomes, no difference in survival. So you decide whether you wanna destroy your sex function and have your prostate removed or suffer radiation to your pelvis and kill your prostate that way 
or you just want to wait. It doesn't make any difference. But I mean, why should you even find out? Why should you even put yourself in a position where you already you know you have prostate cancer? How often are the biopsies positive? Well, in a man 50, half the time they're positive. In a man my age, they're positive at least 90% of the time. So I already know you got trouble. I already know we have no effective treatments. I already know the diet causes it. Why do you need to get a PSA test? Why do you want to join the business? This is screening. This is, this is turning patient, people into patients. This is disease mongering. We know it doesn't work, the treatments. They cause terrible harm. So yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the PSA test in the beginning. You're just asking for a lifetime of worry and treatment and harm, costs. That's all you're going to get. No, no, no. Well, maybe it'll be a stimulation for you to change your diet. That's what people tell me. Well, if I hadn't gotten a mammogram, I wouldn't change my diet. Excuse me. You know, you're already taking insulin. You're already constipated. You're already overweight. You're already getting arthritis all over your body. Why, why do you need to have colon cancer to change your diet or breast cancer or pr prostate cancer? Why, why do you need just one more step of damage to the body? Haven't you had enough? I think so. I have. I had when I was in my late 20s. I said, I've had enough. You remember, I had a stroke at 18. At age 22, my mother called me fat because I weighed 80, 90 pounds more than I weigh now. <clears throat> At age uh, 22, I had a cholesterol done, which was uh, 338. Uh, in my late 20s, early 30s, I had a heart scan done, which was, I flunked. I needed to have at least an initial evaluation, if not full-blown surgery. So, uh, yeah, I figured all this out due to my plantation years and my research in the, in, the, in the libraries and my practice with you folks. And here I am 76 years old and every, every part works, all works. Thank so. you. Okay, we've got three minutes left. So I think we still have time for a few more questions. Kylie's writing in and she's wondering how to fix low estrogen in a young woman of reproductive age. Oh. Well, you can always supplement with skin creams, but I would certainly do it only if it if it resulted in some definitive benefits that were worth the risk and trouble. In other words, if this person was suffering terribly because of what she felt was estrogen deficiency, and I put a little skin cream on her and her life turned around, I'd, I'd say that's a good idea. If it didn't make any difference that she could perceive, I wouldn't do it. You know, low estrogen may be more osteoporosis, but it's less uterine and breast cancer. And uh, I don't know. I guess you could argue that you want to protect the bones by using the skin creams too, but you're incurring some risks. So yeah, you know, carefully. If you look at my book, uh, The McDougall Program for Women, which we give away once in a while, but it's 10 bucks on the website. There's chapter 13 is on hormone replacement therapy. It tells you how I do it. Thank you. Uh, do you any help for restless leg syndrome? I wish. No, not much. There, there are some drugs that are given out there that uh, you can take. I, I don't have the name of them at hand, but some people have recommended magnesium in the past. I think a lot of people, what happens is they go to sleep and they're not tired. And so they lay there and their legs just jump around. I, I think one of the things you ought to consider is that maybe you're getting too much sleep and you ought to cut back. And you ought to go to bed really tired, you know, and then maybe your legs wouldn't be so restless. A little exercise might help too. But uh, otherwise, I, I it's, it's a problem that I don't have an easy solution for. Okay, thank you. Time's and by up. the way, you don't want you don't want to take magnesium because it increases your risk of heart disease. Then. Why don't you tell us what you're up to this? This we're running a program now, Heather, and we've got really, really, you know. I actually, I'm a little concerned because I've heard so little. Everybody's doing so well. I'm, I'm a little lonely, Heather. You guys are doing a pretty good job behind my back, but I'm there, and to make sure you that well, not that I really need to, but it's a great it's program. Going great. It's going great. We're yeah. finishing up. We finish on Tuesday. It was a packed program, and. We don't have another one until January, but we're already filling that one up. 
Um, let's see. Next week, I'm going to the ACLM conference, the American oh. College of Lifestyle Medicine. So I'll be there. Very excited about that. Um, what else are we yeah, doing? We, we need to start working well, on some of our... We have our five, our five course series. And you have a, a, a series on weight loss and so on. So we have a lot of smaller programs that are available on the website. Anyway. We'll be busy. Thank you all for being here. Mm -hmm. It was a great, it was a great hour. We'll see you Spread all the next good news. Sunday. Spread the good news. Come on now, you guys. We need some help. Five o'clock Pacific time every Sunday, unless there's a technical problem. And bring your friends and relatives and let us be let Heather, Mary, and I meet them and show them there's a, a, a better, simpler, safer way to do things. It's the food. Thank you, Heather. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. McDougall. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all next.